Welcome to this discussion of wireless SNR, cell sizes, CCI, and channel utilization. If some of those terms are new to you, fear not, as I'll be covering each one of them as we progress through this video. Before we get started, a quick introduction. I'm John Nesbitt, and I'm a senior network engineer for Chevron. I've been a network engineer for just over seven years, and my journey started off as a network engineer for secured presidential aircraft systems and White House communications. Shortly after starting as a route switch engineer, I developed an interest in wireless technologies and have since moved into a defined wireless engineering role. The agenda for this video is broken down into, into three parts. In part one, we'll be looking at the relationship between the signal strength, noise floor, the MCS index, and cell sizes. This will include understanding the noise floor, the relationship between the signal strength and the noise floor, and how this all relates to cell sizes. In part two, we will take a deeper look into cell sizes. We will talk about how we can control the cell sizes, how power symmetry plays a role in our cell sizes and designs, followed by cell size best practices. In part three, we will look at some problems caused by unauthorized or misconfigured wireless devices. We will look at the 2.4 gigahertz band along with the 5 gigahertz band. To wrap things up, we will look at channel utilization and how this affects wireless. As previously mentioned here in part one, we will be looking at the relationship between signal strength, noise floor, the MCS index, and cell sizes. So what is the noise floor? Well, by definition, the noise floor is the sum of all RF noise sources and unwanted signals, and it is represented as an RSSI, or signal strength value. This will be expressed as a negative number, such as a NEG95 or a NEG80. In a perfect environment, the noise floor should be between NEG100 and NEG95. We can find the noise floor for a given area by using various wireless scanning tools, including spectrum analyzers. Keep in mind that the noise floor may be one value where you are standing and be completely different 500 feet away. Never assume, and when in doubt, scan about. Many things make up the noise floor. While other wireless signals can contribute to the noise floor, of course, many non-wireless devices omit RF that affect the noise floor. Some of these include power lines, arc welders, cordless phones, power strips, DC motors, even that talking Christmas card that your grandparents got you that one time. Okay, that last one may be stretching it a bit, but you get the drift. While the RSSI shows what the signal strength is at the receiver, it does not necessarily indicate the actual quality or the data rate that the client will achieve. The difference between the RSSI, again the signal strength, and the actual noise floor is called SNR, or signal to noise ratio. Experienced wireless designers and engineers will tell you this is the number to pay attention to. Whether it's high throughput, 802.11n, or very high throughput, 802.11ac, the SNR will be the primary candidate in determining the MCS rate or the modulation encoding scheme used. While covering the MCS index in depth is beyond the scope of this video, it governs the achievable data rate based on a handful of factors including the number of spatial streams in use, the RSSI, the SNR, channel width, and whether short guard interval is in use. While a greater SNR value will produce better performance for the wireless network, wireless networks should be designed to fit the need of the business. Otherwise, we would all try for the highest possible SNR and drastically over-engineer our wireless networks. While there is not an IEEE 802.11 standard for SNR, there are some best practices. For general data, a 20 SNR value should be set as the target, and for voice traffic, a minimum SNR value of 25 is desired.
As I mentioned on the previous slide, the noise floor fluctuates as you move through the environment. A smaller SNR value will result in a poorer performance because the client device is unable to achieve a higher MCS value. On the contrary, a greater SNR value will increase performance because the client device is able to achieve that higher MCS rate. A greater SNR value is required to achieve higher data rates and to utilize modern wireless technology to its full potential. I was recently hired to design and install a large outdoor wireless network. After conducting the initial meetings with the client, I was informed they wanted to use FaceTime along with Wi-Fi calling. Well, right away, I knew I would need an SNR value of at least 25 to produce a well-performing uh, WLAN. I figured as long as the noise floor is near the ideal value of NAG95, then I'd be looking at a NAG70 or so uh, RSSI across the entire property. However, after conducting a passive survey and the spectrum analysis, I found that average noise floor was actually around a NAG80. While not ideal, it was still doable. Looking at the RSI, RSSI graph, this would increase the amount of access points I was going to need in order to achieve a NAG60 across the property. Based on what I found for the noise floor, I knew I needed a greater RSSI value to meet the client's need. No big deal, right? Well, not really, but a greater RSSI does do one thing. It decreases the physical cell size and around an access point. This means that a client device will have to be physically closer to the access point in order to achieve that greater RSSI value, in this case, a NAG60. And real quick, a quick disclaimer, please note that the measurements indicated on this slide are not actual cell size distances. They are simply to convey the fact that an access point cell size decreases in range the greater the RSSI value. So from a business perspective, what do smaller cell sizes equal? More access points, which equals more money. From the business side, this is one reason we, as wireless engineers, need to do our due diligence when designing WLANs as to not over-engineer them. Of course, from the engineering side, there are other technical reasons we do not want to over-engineer a WLAN as well, and we'll cover some of those a little bit later on. Here in part two, we're going to take a deeper look at cell sizes and things that affect cell sizes and that are in our power to control. Cell sizes can be controlled by two factors. The first, and quite frankly the simplest method, is by turning the transmit power of an access point up or down, shrinking or expanding the physical cell size respectfully. As you can see in this illustration, the physical cell size shrinks as power is turned down. An APS transmit power can either be set in milliwatts or in dBm, which is a value determined by the vendor. In some cases, such as in Cisco's case, the power, power can be set through the wireless LAN controller, or WLC, by selecting a number from a given number range. Uh, we'll take one through five as, a, as an example. And this number then correlates to an applicable DBM value depending on the AP model and channel selection in use. For Cisco, this number range will also vary depending on the AP model. DBM, or decibel milliwatts, is actually a reference measurement to milliwatts. So be sure you know which one you are setting. Below is a quick reference chart I put together for DBM to milliwatts. When I first started, it did. It took me a minute to wrap my head around the fact that zero dBm equals one milliwatt. Once you start working with RF math and getting more into RF calculations and into the rules of threes and tens, then this becomes easier to understand. The second way to control an AP's cell size is by tuning the allowable data rates. Disabling lower data rates, such as the data rates for 802.11b and 802.11g, we will effectively shrink the usable cell size for a given AP. This is because a client will have to be physically closer to the AP in order to achieve the higher data rate. A client must be within the usable cell size 
of the lowest data rate we are allowing in order to associate with the AP. Okay, so we now know the two ways in which we can effectively change the cell size of an AP. The question is, do we pick just one or both? Is one better than the other? Well, to help answer this, let's reference our diagram here, which is a modified version of our transmit power and uh, data rate cell sizes that we have previously looked at, and they're now overlaid on top of one another. Right now, our two cells, that is our data rate cells and our transmit power cells, are equaled. So let's go ahead and set our minimum data rate to 24 megabytes per second. And we're going to disable all the lower data rates, but leave our transmit power where it is. What we just did is effectively shrink our usable cell size. However, our physical cell size, which is controlled by the transmit power, has remained the same. Next, let's add a user to our BSS, or our basic server set. And a quick note, we are working on a BSS in this example because we only have one access point. If we have multiple access points, we'll be working in an extended server set or an ESS. Even though our user is within the physical boundary of the cell, again, which is controlled by the transmit power, and our user can even see the WLAN with their device, they are unable to connect at the required data rate because they are simply too far from the AP in order to achieve the minimum data rate that we have set, in this example, the 24 megabytes per second. In order to associate with the WLAN, the user would need to move physically closer to the AP or in an extended server set deployment, it would need to roam to another closer access point if one existed. Setting the correct data rates will depend on the desired outcome for the WLAN. Setting the transmit power takes a little more finesse as to not cause problems, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. When designing or even troubleshooting a WLAN, we need to ensure we have proper cell overlap for seamless roaming within our extended service set or ESS. Again, an extended service set is a WLAN that contains multiple access points. Unfortunately for us, there is no IEEE standard that mandates when a client must roam to another AP. The IEEE has left this up to the vendors and their proprietary roaming algorithms. For example, vendor A might base roaming solely off of the RSSI value. Vendor B might look at the SNR value, while vendor C takes the combination of the two. While we, we being the wireless engineers that is, cannot force a client to roam, we can build and configure our WLAN to help convince our clients to roam when we want them to. Keep in mind though, while we may get one client to roam the way we want, another client from another vendor may roam differently. It all depends on the parameters a vendor has configured in the device to determine when it's going to roam. One thing we can do to help our clients roam is by ensuring we have proper cell overlaps between our APs. On paper, designing cell overlaps with perfect circles is a piece of cake. However, getting proper cell overlap in the real world can be a little more difficult to achieve. There is no cookie cutter design when it comes to designing cell overlaps. It's going to take practice with either lab equipment or real world AP on a stick surveys and by using the, the, variables, the various planning tools such as Air Magnet or Ekahau. The easiest part when it comes to cell overlaps is the best practices. For general data or even lower density areas, we are looking to achieve a 20% cell overlap. For a WLAN that will have voice traffic, we want to target a 30% cell overlap. In a word to the wise, in real world scenarios, always try and conduct proper surveys in order to best determine the appropriate transmit power for each AP. Having an AP's transmit power set too high can cause larger cell overlaps 
and can add to the noise floor. Another factor we need to discuss is something called power symmetry. Power symmetry is the balance between an AP's transmit power and a client's transmit power. Typically, a client's device has their power set statically from the vendor. In very rare cases, can a user adjust their device's transmit power? Here we can see we have an AP with its applicable cell size. And for the sake of this example, let's say the AP has a transmit power of 15 milliwatts. Next, let's introduce a client. As we can see, client one has a transmit power of 12 milliwatts and is inside the cell size of AP1. And AP1 is inside the cell size of client one. Looking at these cell sizes for both the AP and our first client, the client should be able to see our, our WLAN and be able to associate to our WLAN assuming all configurations are correct. Now, let's add another client. As you can see, our new client, client two, is inside the cell boundaries of our AP, but they do not have enough power to make it back to the AP. Setting an AP's transmit power too high can cause what I like to call a false hope network. No, this is not an official term, but just one I like to use when describing power symmetry issues. And what I mean by a false hope network is that when we can see the WLAN on our client device and the signal strength may look good, but we are actually unable to connect because our device simply does not have enough power to transmit back to the AP, or in other words, the AP cannot hear our client device. With this in mind, as a best practice, we want to set our AP's transmit power to match the power setting of our least capable client in our WLAN, or at least as close as possible. This could be tricky because you may not know what your least capable device may be. In our final part, we're going to take a look at some problems that can occur on a wireless network by unauthorized or misconfigured wireless devices. Please note that the images on the next three slides are not mine. They were actually pulled from various sources on the internet. Wi-Fi, or wireless, operates in two frequency ranges, referred to as the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz bands. We're going to focus on the 2.4 gigahertz band first. In the 2.4 gigahertz frequency range, there are 14 22 megahertz wide DSS SS channels, or 20 megahertz wide for OFDM. With the exception of channel 14, each of these channels has a 5 megahertz spacing between them. In the United States, only 11 channels are available for use. And while this may seem great, most of these channels overlap due to the limited frequency range in the 2.4 gigahertz band. In fact, only three channels do not overlap, channels 1, 6, and 11. Best practice here tells us that we should only use channels 1, 6, 11 and alternate between these three. All other channels, such as 2, 3, 4, 8, 10, all cause what is called neighbor channel interference. Neighbor channel interference is caused by clients in neighboring channels that share frequency space without first listening if the RF medium is clear for transmission. This is known as a clear channel assessment, or CCA. Neighbor, neighbor channel interference can cause significant data corruption and force clients to retransmit, which can severely degrade the performance of a WLAN. And a common term that you may hear in place of neighbor channel interference is adjacent channel interference, or ACI. While these terms are used synonymously, it is actually an incorrect usage of 
ACI. ACI, according to the IEEE standards, is the next channel in a frequency space that does not overlap with another channel. In the 2.4 gigahertz range, if we are using channel one, then channel six would be the next adjacent channel. Likewise, if we are using channel six, channel one or channel 11 would be our adjacent channel. By definition, it is not possible to cause adjacent channel interference. The five gigahertz range is much more forgiving. In this range, we are given 25, five megahertz wide channels to work with. These channels are divided into four bands called the Uni1, Uni2, Uni2E or Uni2E extended, and the Uni3. The Uni2 extended band does contain channels shared by radar, and these are referred to as DFS channels. While we can still use these channels freely, certain rules do apply if we decide to use a DFS channel. The main rule being that if radar event is detected on a channel that we are using, then the WLAM must change its channel for that particular AP. This can get tricky because if it changes to another DFS channel, the access point must wait 60 seconds before transmissions can occur again to ensure that no radar events are detected on this new DFS channel we have moved to. This can have a detrimental effect on wireless clients, especially those using voice as they will be disconnected unless they are able to roam to another AP in an ESS environment. Channel bonding can also be used more freely in the five gigahertz range. Uh, this is due to the more non-overlapping channels we have available for use. While we are able to use channel bonding up to 160 megahertz wide, we still need to do so with caution as to not create uh, CCI for ourselves. While we are talking about it, channel bonding that is, a quick note regarding channel bonding and the 2.4 gigahertz range is that while we can configure channel bonding in this space, it is not recommended to do so. And we should only stick with the 20 megahertz wide channels. The reason is simply because there is not enough frequency space available in the 2.4 gigahertz range to use channel bonding and have a WLAN free of CCI. Okay, we have two WLANs, both operating in the 2.4 gigahertz range and both on channel one. What do you think will happen? Will devices in both WLANs be able to transmit? The answer is, well, it depends. While we would prefer to stagger the channel use, such as a WLAN in channel one and the other in 11, both WLANs in channel one might still work fine. While we will experience co-channel interference, it boils down to the channel utilization. What that is, is simply how much talking is going on on that given channel. In this scenario, if channel one had a utilization of say 15%, then both WLANs would operate fairly smooth, given you'd still see some retransmissions here and there, but overall, not too bad. But now let's crank that utilization up to 80%. What do you think clients would experience in both WLANs? Well, with a high channel utilization, clients would experience excessive retransmissions and data corruption, resulting in a poor WLAN performance and, of course, very frustrated users. As you can see in this image, wherever this scan was taken, the 2.4 gigahertz range which is shown on the left side of the image, is almost useless due to the high channel utilizations across the entire frequency range. Now, additionally, there are multiple SSIDs on off channels, that is channels other than 1, 6, or 11, and this will cause our neighbor channel interference and thus add to our problem. Even in the 5 GHz band, we can see high channel utilizations and SSIDs stacked on top of one another causing CCI. While we typically don't see neighbor channel interference in this range, CCI can still be a problem. However, if I were to deploy a new WLAN in the location wherever the scan was conducted, 
that I would probably opt for channels in the Uni 2 and Uni 2 extended bands, given that I don't mind monitoring for radar events. As you can see, a lot of planning, thoroughness, and thought go into designing a well-performing wireless network. And just remember, when in doubt, scan about. I'm John Nesbitt. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has been informative.